Hello and welcome to my talk on the history of British Hong Kong. Today we'll talk about the island and uh, its politics, its uh, history, its economics, its social life during the 150 years or so of British rule. And we'll give you a little bit of background. And then the second talk of my uh, two talk set will uh, take over from the handover of Hong Kong back to China in 1997 and deal with uh, the current affairs and the issues that are um, shaping the life in this vibrant corner of Asia uh, from 1997 until now. So let's get on with, in, with it and talk about the history of British Hong Kong today. Opium and Tea to the Fragrant Harbor. This is the title I've chosen for my talk today. Opium and Tea, we'll see in shortly why these two plants occupied such a special role in the history of uh, British Hong Kong. Fragrant Harbor is the name that was used for Hong Kong and particularly for the uh, what is now the Aberdeen Harbor on the southern coast of the island because of the inc incense that was traded there and the intense uh, flavors and uh, fragrances that were uh, coming out of the of the holds of the ships and the stores of the mer merchants who were uh, trading incense. So let's go to the early part of the 19th century. This is the first earliest picture of Hong Kong that is available today. And you can see there's only a few houses around, a few ships coming in and out. It's basically a tranquil fishing village of no more than some 7,500 inhabitants, talking about here the 1840s. It soon began to develop uh, quite quickly uh, at that time because of the beginning of uh, trade with the West. Western powers were pushing for trade with uh, China. The Chinese were not so keen. They came from a period when they wanted to preserve China uh, and avoid contacts with the outside world. This kind of attitude came and went a number of times in Chinese history. At this particular juncture, though, in the middle of the 19th century, China ruled by the Manchu Qing dynasty was quite weak and it was incapable of holding off the foreigners pushing at its borders. And you can see here, China lost territory to Russia in the Northwest and the Northeast, the Russian empire, to the British uh, in the Southwest, uh, to British India at the time. And um, also uh, Taiwan, was lost later on together with Dalian, the small northern uh, port that you can see orange here to the Japanese. And then, of course, there is Hong Kong, which is the main subject of our discussion today. So why were the British so interested in Hong Kong? Well, you have to start from the fact that the British loved tea. They loved it then and they love it now. And they produced a lot of tea in uh, British-ruled India and Sri Lanka, but not enough tea. Uh, they didn't have enough to satisfy the demand of the homeland back in London and Birmingham and, and Glasgow. On the other hand, um, China produced a lot of tea. And Chinese tea was not only abundant and more than the Chinese would drink, uh, consume, but also it was a very good quality. The British also loved other things in China. They loved porcelain, of course, and they loved uh, silk. And this is a photo of uh, silk being spun on uh, spools in China. So the British want tea, they want porcelain, they want silk. What can they give back to the Chinese in exchange? Well, one thing that was in demand in China at the time was British clocks. The grandfather clocks were used to talk about now, but they did, British didn't really produce enough to satisfy um, the demand of uh, all that tea and porcelain and silk that was being imported. They also uh, had silver, but uh, silver was expensive and um, the British didn't have enough or didn't want to give enough of their silver to China. Then what? 
they figured out that there was a large market for opium in China. The Chinese loved to smoke opium. This is a photo of a uh, smokehouse in China in the 19th century. It's an etching. And uh, so therefore, the British said, well, why don't we sell you some opium? Chinese were not keen on that. For a long time, the Chinese emperors had been trying to stop or slow down at least the use of uh, opium in the country because it was bad for health, obviously, of the people, as well as for the economy. And so different emperors that you see here uh, pictured in this photo from uh, had uh, bans, issued bans on the trade and consumption of opium in 1729, 1786, 1800, and 1839. But um, the demand was still there, and the Chinese knew that British, uh, the British uh, in India had a big surplus of opium. This is a drying room in uh, Patna in British India um, from this etching of 19, 1850. Uh, another etching from the same area. This is a stacking room where the dried opium was stacked and being prepared for export. So the Chinese have tea and the British have opium. Now, the British tried to export this opium, and um, they had mixed success until in 1839, uh, stocks of opium were destroyed by the order of the um, Chinese government in some stores in Guangzhou, what was uh, then referred to as Canton. The uh, Some people got killed, a lot of opium, was destroyed, um, economic damage for the British exporters of opium. The British got very upset and they started a war. And in 1839, they started what is now referred to as the First Opium War, where uh, British forces, which at the time, of course, included the Irish army that you can see in this particular photo, uh, fought the um, backward and ill-equipped the Chinese army, and uh, defeated it. Uh, not everybody wanted this war in the United Kingdom. Uh, for example, Gladstone famously opposed it. He said, our war against China is the most infamous and atrocious. Uh, an unjust war in its origin calculated to cover this country with permanent disgrace. This is uh, future prime minister, not yet. Prime Minister Gladstone. However, um, Lord Palmerston, who then also became Prime Minister, was the main um, motor behind this uh, this initiative, this uh, uh, war. And uh, Prime Minister Robert Peel uh, did, uh, in fact, take the responsibility and start and start the war. It lasted about three years. The uh, British fleet was uh, far superior to the Chinese. They um, destroyed Chinese uh, ships quite easily. And um, then the peace treaty was signed in 1841, uh, which had three consequences. One was to give Hong Kong Island, the island of Hong Kong, to the UK in perpetuity. This is a painting of the signature of the, the signing of the, of the peace treaty. Uh, at that time, this gentleman, Henry Pottinger, Pottinger uh, was, was appointed by Queen Victoria as her first governor of Hong Kong. The second consequence of the treaty was to open not just Hong Kong, but a number of different ports uh, to trade, Ningbo, Shanghai, Xiamen at that time referred to as Amoy and Fuzhou. This is the beginning of what the Chinese would later refer to as the century of humiliation that would only end with the end of World War II and the proclamation of the People's Republic by Mao. So from the 1840s to the 1940s. The third consequence of the uh, war was that the reparations had to be paid in uh, large amounts of silver and uh, extraterritorial rights were 
uh, signed off to um, by the Chinese over the territories that uh, I mentioned earlier, and specifically Hong Kong, where British law would apply and not Chinese law. And this, of course, has long-term implications on the status of the island to the present day. You still have um, British law that plays an important role in Hong Kong law. So the British take over and they start developing the island of Hong Kong. This, this is an image of the Harbour Master's House that was built by the British. So the deal is tea for opium. So the British now can export large amount of um, their opium from India and get a lot of tea going back to, uh, to the UK. And you can see that in the first flag of British Hong Kong, where these ships are by the harbor and there's a trader there with some boxes, presumably boxes of uh, a tea being shipped, ready to be shipped back to the UK. At this time, Hong Kong has grown from 7,500, which I mentioned uh, at the beginning, to uh, about 32,000 inhabitants. So the British, British occupation brings with it a significant increase in population and economic development. Still, the UK cannot export enough. The, even though these harbors have been open to trade and all this opium now makes its way to China, uh, this is an image of uh, the a British salesman in Guangzhou, Ben Canton, 1858. Still, there is not enough to buy enough tea to quench the thirst of British drinkers back in London and the UK. Demand for opium, on the other hand, in China is very strong. And again, there is not enough British opium coming from India uh, to satisfy that demand. I want to emphasize one more time, China this time is very weak. It is very weak uh, because of internal strife. The, Taiping Rebellion was taking place, a huge civil war during which tens of millions of people died. Won't get into the details of that now, but suffice it to say that the Chinese government was in no way to resist British pressure to increase trade. And this perception was clear in London and the Second Opium War was started by the British with the French this time, uh, in 1860. This is an image of the French and British fleets assembling together in Hong Kong to get ready to strike at China. An image of the Battle of Bali Chow, Bali Chow Bridge in 1860, which again, the backward Chinese armies are easily defeated by the combined forces of the British and the French. So, we come to the end of the Second Opium War, and this time there's more territory going to the British, the, particularly the land of Kowloon, this that uh, you see uh, marked with the light um, purple color here, sort of mainland. This is on the mainland of China now, whereas Hong Kong Island, of course, is an island. And also, uh, dynasty, uh, the Qing Dynasty has to pay reparations in silver. So very humiliating defeat for China. 1860, time of the Second Opium War, Hong Kong has got a, about 120,000 inhabitants. So in the in about 10 years, it doubled from 50 something, 52 to 100, and to more than doubled actually to 120. So it is really developing uh, its economy based on this trade of tea for opium and others as well, very fast indeed. 1870s, you can see, and this is a real photograph now, the beginning of the photography era, you can see a lot of ships uh, at Angkor in uh, Victoria Harbor, uh, what is now called Victoria Harbor between Hong Kong Island and Kowloon. 1881, 161,000 inhabitants, more and more ships, more and more trade, more and more money um, making its way around. Hong Kong is now a very busy place 
indeed. And um, it's not just the British who make money, a lot of Chinese make a lot of money as well, because now this is a gateway uh, between the once enclosed and self-isolated Qing Empire and the rest of the world. In 1891, we're up to 221,000 inhabitants, and you can see already the first uh, steamships making their way to Hong Kong Harbor. The Hong Kong economy uh, booms, and uh, in 1899, it is estimated that up to 40% of China's international trade uh, is going through Hong Kong. This is a, a ship in Hong Kong Harbor in uh, the 1890s. You can see here in this graph, the opium imports into China uh, skyrocketing, really going through the roof in the period uh, from the uh, 18 well, from the beginning, the, before the British presence, to the 1880. Obviously, this is not very good for the Chinese health, and uh, the government is not happy, but there's not much they can do about it. After two wars, the British wanted even more land. They wanted more land to control more trade, to make the Hong Kong Island and Kowloon more easily defensible. And uh, they didn't start a third war this time, however, they uh, negotiated a lease, 99 year lease of uh, the so-called new territories uh, that you can see here in purple. We'll see how this is very important because this was signed in 1898 and the 99 year lease for these new territories, they're called the new territories, would expire in 1997. And we will see how that is an important date because it will mark the return of all of Hong Kong uh, to China. So this is a map of um, Hong Kong at that time. And you can see the extent of the Chinese empire and uh, the importance of Hong Kong as a hub. Uh, both for sea routes uh, going to the Philippines, to Southeast Asia, and uh, for and land routes as well going up north to Beijing and west toward Central Asia toward the ancient Silk Route, if you want. So this is a situation. With, uh, I mentioned about the weakness of the Chinese Empire, and this is a poster from the uh, latter part of the 19th century, which shows the great powers carving up China for them. And you can see the um, Queen Victoria, Empress Victoria, the Prussians, the Russians, the French, and the Japanese, all taking chunks of uh, Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia, and of China as well. Even smaller countries like uh, yeah, Portugal, and we will see later um, Austria, well, it wasn't that small at that time, it was a big empire. Italy, which was newly near, uh, newly unified, they all took chunks of China uh, uh, because the Chinese were so weak and couldn't do anything about it. So we come to the end of the century. Hong Kong has got now a quarter of a million inhabitants. Uh, trade is booming. And the opium consumption uh, continues to grow. This is a photo of a smokehouse uh, in the 20th century. In 1931, we have up to 841 million inhabitants. So the economy and the population of Hong Kong uh, is growing along with its trade. And uh, Hong Kong is now a major gateway of China uh, to the rest of the world. And then comes the war the Second Sino-Japanese War. The Japanese, of course, were pushing at that time to expand their influence in Asia. Their argument was that if the French and the British and the Dutch and the Americans have an empire in Asia, why wouldn't Japan be entitled to one? And so they attacked uh, China. Uh, they had taken over Korea already uh, in, at the beginning of the 20th century, and now they uh, attack uh, China. And in uh, 
1941, uh, shortly after the Pearl Harbor attacks, they invade and occupy Hong Kong as well. And they, of course, play on the um, patriotism of the Chinese and uh, try to uh, put the Chinese against the British. This is an image of Japanese forces marching in Hong Kong. Of course, the Japanese lost the war and the, when that was coming, the uh, leaders of the US, the UK, and China, at that time, General Chiang Kai-shek, they met in Cairo in 1943, and they agreed that extraterritorial rights in China would be abolished. You remember, uh, I mentioned how different powers had taken bits and pieces of Chinese land during the 19th century, they would all be given back to China, which is now an ally of the US and the UK in their fight against Japan. The only exception is uh, Hong Kong. The Chinese agreed to leave uh, Hong Kong to the British uh, for the time being. And um, the uh, there was a talk of uh, Hong Kong being uh, returned to the UK, but um, it was not. And um, the motto that you can see in this poster uh, showing Chiang Kai-shek and Churchill as, as their best friend is all for one and one for all. So they are um, sort of um, best of friends and it's a love-hate relationship. The Chinese cannot swallow the British, continued British presence in Hong Kong, but on the other hand, they want to, they were allies of the British during the war and they want to continue to have the support of the British, particularly uh, in the fight against uh, Mao, the communist uh, party that was uh, fighting against Chiang Kai-shek in the Chinese civil war. So one for all, all for one, it didn't really work out very well. Chiang Kai-shek lost and uh, in 1949, Mao Zedong, proclaimed the uh, People's Republic of China. And um, a lot of people thought, well, okay, now obviously the Chinese are gonna kick the British out. Uh, it's become untenable uh, for the British to maintain this colony in what is now uh, revitalized uh, independent China. But uh, um, surprisingly uh, for many, uh, Mao accepted that the British would continue uh, to remain in Hong Kong for the time being. And he um, made a deal. And uh, in exchange for that, of course, the British recognized the government of Mao, the legitimate government of China, which many other countries, including the US, uh, did not. So you had a deal whereby Mao got its legitimacy and uh, the UK managed to keep Hong Kong. This is really funny because at the same time, British forces were fighting against uh, Mao's forces in Korea. There was the Korea War, of course, in 1950 to 1953. And here is a photo of British forces uh, fighting next to uh, Chinese nationalist forces led by Chiang Kai-shek against Mao Zedong. So on the one hand, uh, the UK recognized the government of Mao as the legitimate government of China. On the other hand, it was fighting against it um, side by side with Chiang Kai-shek. These are the sometimes unfathomable uh, intricacies of diplomacy that um, one encounters uh, difficult to explain, except for the fact that this is was in the, uh, considered to be in the British national interest at the time. Be that as it may, Hong Kong continues to develop. And in, 19, in the 1950s, it tops 2 million inhabitants. That uh, population uh, grew so fast. It was also due to the fact that the uh, number of refugees escaping the civil war of China had increased considerably. This is an image on the right also. Of, uh, the British developed Hong Kong even further. And for example, the tram lines were installed that you can still use today. And uh, this is until the year 1953, when a great fire destroyed much of Hong Kong. And a lot of old wooden houses were 
completely destroyed. The fire had swept uh, very easily from one house to the next. <laughs> and uh, that was, of course, tragic uh, in itself, but also it was a moment of transformation where Hong Kong, uh, the Hong Kong urban um, uh, arrangements were completely redone and the uh, construction of new houses uh, was undertaken using cement and bricks and vertical uh, skyscrapers instead of low-lying low -lying, uh, wooden houses. By 1961, this is what Hong Kong uh, looks like. The uh, ruins of the Great Fire, of course, have all been uh, swept away and then cleared, and then you now have a, what is already a modern, modern metropolis of uh, over uh, three million people. Hong Kong is a British colony, and it has its own passport, British passport, uh, its own money, the Hong Kong dollar, which is pegged to the U.S. dollar, but um, it's got its own uh, paper notes. The British passport is a unique one because the British passport of Hong Kong made the Hong Kongers British nationals, but not British citizens. It's kind of complicated, but basically means they had protection of the crown, but they couldn't have all the rights of citizens. For example, they couldn't move to the UK if they wanted to. Banking develops uh, as a new industry in Hong Kong. It's no longer just... Uh, uh, tea and porcelain and, and silver. Of course, opium is now banned and uh, things have changed. And uh, the uh, financial uh, aspect of the Hong Kong economy uh, develops considerably. You can see here on the right, the building of the Bank of China, which at the time, this is before the handover, of course, the British is still in control but was the kind of unofficial embassy of the People's Republic of China in uh, in Hong Kong. Hong Kong Shanghai Bank Corporation, of course, HSBC, we all know, and probably many of us have uh, an account with them. I, I used to have one. And this is what it looked like back in the 1930s on the left, and on the right is the new headquarters that is um, in on Hong Kong Island today. Very impressive uh, headquarters of the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank Corporation. I went there once uh, in, nine, in 2010 or something, and it was during Chinese New Year. And I was amazed uh, to be met by this uh, bank employee who gave me a traditional Chinese red packet. You know, the Chinese give red packets with money inside for uh, gifts, for birthdays and anniversary and, and whatever. And um, so I thought, okay, you know, it's kind of a nice souvenir. And then I looked and there was actually real money inside. So if you're in Hong Kong during the Chinese New Year time, go to HSBC and you may be lucky and get a packet of uh, real money to spend. Manufacturing in Hong Kong uh, is now in full development and it's no longer uh, just the um, uh, tea that people are interested in buying uh, through Hong Kong, but it's also a lot of... Um, electronics, toys, uh, clocks. Those of us who are old enough will remember made in Hong Kong was uh, very common in the 60s and 70s in, uh, in Europe. By the 1980s, Hong Kong has topped 5 million inhabitants and it is now a modern shipping hub. In addition to the manufacturing and the finance, it also has now a world-class uh, shipping facilities that um, allow it to become a, um, a port of reference for world trade. A word, a special word uh, needs to be spent on uh, local film, the local film industry. Uh, everybody will remember Bruce Lee, the uh, most famous actor of the Kung Fu um, movies also uh, Ronald Reagan probably played a role in uh, the Hong Kong movie together with Rhonda Fleming and uh, it was then that uh, Hong Kong had and it still does have a very flourishing uh, movie industry kind of 
referred to as the Hollywood of, the, of East Asia. But time goes by and we are now coming to the middle of the 1980s. Um, do you remember that the lease of the new territories was 99 years, started in 1898. So 1997 is fast approaching. And uh, at this time, the British and the Chinese government uh, sit down and start negotiating the handover of uh, Hong Kong back to China. Of course, Mao has died and Deng Xiaoping is now the paramount leader of China. And here he is negotiating with Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s, the return of Hong Kong to China. The UK tried to propose uh, a kind of mixed solution where they would, London would retain uh, some sort of hold on the administration of the island. They tried to argue that um, the history made Hong Kong very British. The people of Hong Kong, of course, were very keen um, to remain, if not British, they didn't want to really go under the Communist Party of China. And... Um, Deng Xiaoping, however, didn't have uh, didn't wouldn't have any of this, and uh, he said no. Uh, Hong Kong is Chinese, and it is going back to China. End the story. And we now know, which we didn't at the time, that uh, he had prepared plans to invade Hong Kong with the Chinese army that you can see here on the right. Had the British insisted on keeping a control or some kind of control in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong is handed back. And what is the deal? The deal is what's referred to as one country, two systems. So the deal was uh, Hong Kong is going to be part of China. So it's one country. However, it will keep a separate system from the rest of China. I mentioned earlier that Hong Kongers had uh, their own passport, which allows them uh, to travel visa-free to most of the world, whereas the Chinese from the mainland, they need visas. They have their own money, which is convertible, whereas the Chinese money is not convertible. They had basically no censorship uh, in printing books and the internet. They do now, some, but still, if you go to Hong Kong, you can find for example, that uh, if you want to use Google or Facebook or Instagram or Yahoo, it's it's all completely free, which is not the case in mainland China. So one country, all China, all of it is China, but it's different system. And in 1984, 1984 uh, Thatcher signed uh, the agreement uh, along these lines with Prime Minister Zhao Ziyang, and you can see uh, Jeffrey Hao in the back and Deng Xiaoping uh, looking on. So as I said, uh, Hong Kong keeps its own money, its own legislator, legislature, the uh, Legislative Council, LECCO, uh, that has more powers than local equivalent councils in the mainland uh, in the, of China, although uh, more and more, as we will see in my next presentation, these powers are being eroded. So China is making Hong Kong look more like it is part of really one country as opposed to two systems. The um, <clears throat> British passport is still there in Hong Kong, although now the uh, there is also a Hong Kong passport. So if you live in Hong Kong, depending on when you were born and different rules, but you can have a British passport, which uh, does not allow you to move to the UK, however. It's, uh, it allows you to go to the UK and visit, but visa-free, but not to move, although the UK are now making that easier. And then you can have a Chinese Hong Kong passport, which you can see here on the left, uh, which is um, another passport that is instead is, is uh, it does require visas, and but it makes it easier for the Hong Kongers who want to go and work and live in, uh, in the mainland. There is a big discussion about democracy in Hong Kong and how the Chinese are eroding it. 
and uh, are not uh, respecting the freedoms of uh, the one country, two systems, the basic law agreement that Thatcher and Deng Xiaoping negotiated, as I mentioned a minute ago. But then that is, I think, is true. On the other hand, one has to keep in mind Hong Kong really never had a democracy. Um, John Browning, who was the Bowring, sorry, who was the fourth governor of Hong Kong in the 18. 50s tried to establish some kind of local limited local rule but he was overruled by the um, colonial office back in london who's which was headed by a gentleman by the name of la boucher who's a very conservative very strict he became famous in 1885 for criminalizing homosexuality uh, for which Oscar Wilde was uh, sentenced to two years of hard label. And uh, this gentleman, who was in charge of the British colonial office, uh, said, quote, the Chinese are deficient in the essential elements of morality on which a social order rests, end quote. And therefore, they were not to be given any um, power to rule themselves in Hong Kong. Anyway, he also uh, went, and we back to more recent times, the British tried again to um, establish some kind of local self-rule of democracy in um, Hong Kong, the way they had done in a similar situation in Singapore. But um, then Prime Minister Zhou Enlai in 1958 clearly Made, made it clear that this was not a good idea. He said, uh, quote, the conspiracy of self-governments as in Singapore would be a very friendly act, a very unfriendly, unfriendly act against China. And um, the official of the Chinese government who was in charge of relations with Hong Kong and the British in 1960, Mr. Liao Chenzhi, said that China ch shall not hesitate to take positive action to have Hong Kong liberated should the status quo be changed. The status quo meant British rule of Hong Kong from London, no self-rule, no democracy in Hong Kong. In other words, the Chinese wanted Hong Kong to be handed back to them as a full British colony and not as a self-ruling territory the way Singapore had become. For obvious reasons, because it would have been much more difficult to uh, control a territory that was self-ruling. Chris Patton was the last governor um, of uh, Hong Kong. Of course, he, like all the others, were appointed uh, in London. The Hong Kongers never had anything uh, to say about who uh, was would be the governor of, of uh, Hong Kong. He said upon departing Hong Kong 1997, Hong Kong people now have to run Hong Kong. Of course, it was easy for him to say as a British official uh, on his way back to London, but um, obviously that um, didn't fly with the Chinese and the Hong Kongers never really had a chance. So here we are, 1st of July 1997. It's a very rainy night. This is the at midnight, uh, between 30th, the 30th of June and the 1st of July, 1997, the British uh, flag comes down for the last time. Uh, Hong Kong has now six and a half million inhabitants. You can see here, yeah, then Prince Charles, uh, now King, with the, uh, Jiang Zemin, leader of China, who succeeded Deng Xiaoping, Hu Jintao on the left. Uh, Tony Blair and, and all the other, and Chris Patton. And this is the handshake that sealed uh, the end of uh, British rule in Hong Kong. It was a very rainy night. Um, I remember watching it live. This is uh, Chris Patton, the last governor um, uh, to whom the flag that had just been lowered for the last time was handed. Uh, handed over, and uh, these are some of the titles of the newspapers of the time. Last Ra and the Empire Closes Down. Um, arguably, the return of Hong Kong to China marked the end of the British Empire. 
course, Britain still has territories in various parts of the world, but um, for most people, that's when the final uh, full stop uh, of uh, was uh, was um, put down on the history of uh, of the empire, and of course, big celebrations uh, in China. Welcome back, Hong Kong. Deng Xiaoping is. Uh, celebrated as the architect of the peaceful return of Hong Kong um, to uh, China. And of course, uh, everybody is very happy. And you can see a typical image of a poster in China of uh, the various Chinese minorities that you can see here um, celebrating the return of uh, Hong Kong to the family of China. <laughs> By this time, Hong Kong has got seven and a half million people. You remember one of my first slides, I mentioned the figure of 7,500. So here we are uh, in 2020, after 180 years, give or take a few, um, the population has grown by a thousand times from 7,500 to seven and a half million people, 1,000 times uh, bigger than it was at the beginning of the period that I covered in this presentation. And with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And uh, um, I hope that um, this was interesting to understand the history and some of the lesser known aspects, perhaps, of British Hong Kong. And uh, I Look forward to um, putting online my second presentation on the current affairs of Hong Kong after 1997, after the handover back to China and until the present day. Thank you for your attention. Your comments you can put in the uh, uh, under the, um, the video here, and uh, I'm ready to take your uh, questions if you'd like and hear your feedback. Thank you very much. See you at the next video.